praise you, Lord. Oh, we bless you today, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are, Lord. Lord, we trust in you. We thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. That, Lord, you rule over everything, every circumstance, every spirit, Lord, every principality, every power, my God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's give him a clap and then take our seats. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I've got to ask Dave, he may be seated. I've got to ask a question um, this week, and uh, I wonder whether you can help me with it. It's, uh, can a kangaroo jump higher than the Empire State Building? Well, the answer is yes. It really is. You know why? Because the Empire State Building can't jump. Oh. And then I got asked another question. Why is Peter Pan always flying everywhere? Why is he flying all the time? Because he never lands. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. Thanks, Kurt. That helped. <laughs> okay, can the deacons hand out the communion, please? Hallelujah. How are you today? Wonderful. You had a great week? Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Isn't it great that we have a God who's with us every single day? He takes care of every problem when we trust in him. Hallelujah. And so I want to read today uh, from, where are we? Sorry. Okay, uh, Romans 8, life in the spirit. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah, we're no longer under the law. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh and could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Praise God. Now we have a Holy Spirit night tonight. And... Uh, those of you who've been to the Holy Spirit know, know how free it is, know how fantastic it is and how God always has the same message for, from everybody. You know, when it comes, I, I just give the whole meeting to the Spirit of God. We just trust the Lord for that and the pastors do that. But always the same thing gets said and it gets confirmed and it gets verified by the Spirit of God who is in us. Praise God. And you know what? He wants to do the same thing in your life every day, isn't that? You can have that same experience every single day of your life. Praise God. Because you, you pray and ask the Spirit to lead you. That's what the Christian life is all about. Having the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. And God is in a relationship with us. Praise God. And we walk with Him every moment of every day. Do we talk to Him about all of our worries and all of our cares? Do we share with him the things that bother us? And do we cast them onto him? That's what God wants for us, is to walk in freedom, to walk in love and joy and peace every single day. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 4 says, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, not only is it a great experience, but we fulfill the requirements that God expects of us as we follow the leading of His Spirit and do what He tells us to do. Amen? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind of the flesh on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who dares not have the Spirit of Christ 
does not belong to him. You know, when Jesus hung on that cross at Calvary, darkness fell over the face of the earth for three hours. I went three, you know, like that's three, okay? Not that. <laughs> Praise God. But darkness fell over the face of the earth for three hours. And Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know the Holy Spirit left him? He had the Spirit without measure, the Bible tells us. But the Holy Spirit left him at that time because to be a perfect sacrifice for mankind, he had to hang there as a man, 100%. And the Spirit of God turned his face away. And there's that interesting point there that... You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. And for those three hours, the Spirit of God left Jesus and he hung there as a man to become the perfect sacrifice. You know, we need to be encouraging the Spirit of God to be in us all the time, every day, walking with him, acknowledging him, even the little things. You know, do you, do you pray about the little things or do you think, oh, God's not bothered with the little things? You know, but just to go to God and say, Lord, help me with this next thing that I have to do. Do you know it'll go a lot better if you just pray a little prayer like that? Help me, Lord, to to be positive in this next situation. Help me, Lord, to, to spread your word by my actions, by being a living letter to this world. Praise God. It says, but if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hallelujah. Can we stand in his presence? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus. Let's just call on him for a moment yourselves. Just, Lord, just speak to us, Lord. Each one. Lord, help us to cast our cares on you today because you care for us. Lord, we don't have to worry. Lord, we just thank you that we can give it to you. And you'll take care of it, Lord. Help us not to hang on to it, Lord, because when we hang on to it, We're holding it back from you, and there's nothing you can do, Lord. So just help us, Jesus, to truly cast our cares on you, Lord, because you care for us. Hallelujah. You care for us. He cares for you. And as though you're an individual here today, I'm talking to you. He cares for you. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you, Lord, for the life that you gave when you didn't have to give it, Jesus. We bless you and we remember you today. We remember that you died on that cross and, Lord, that you shed your blood for the forgiveness of our sin and that your body was broken, Lord. That spirit of flesh is the body it's talking about because not one bone of his body was broken. But it's that spirit of flesh that you broke, that we can overcome the flesh in our hearts and we can walk with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So that's what our little uh, biscuit or bread, we use a little cracker. But it's a representation of Jesus. We don't believe in transubstantiation. That means that this actually becomes the body of Christ. But we believe that as we partake, we remember what he did for us. So let's partake of the bread. we thank you for your blood that was shed for the remission of our sin. Thank you, Lord, that though our sins were as scarlet, Lord, now they're white as snow. We thank you for that sacrifice that you made for us, Lord, that caused us to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies 
and live with your Holy Spirit every day. Thank you, Lord. Help us never to take that for granted, Lord. Help us never to treat it cheaply, Lord, but to hold it in honour every day. In Jesus' name. Let's partake together, saints. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's lift our voices and thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless you. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise our God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, God inhabits the praises of his people. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus. When you praise the Lord, you cast demons out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you praise the Lord, Satan can't stand it, so he runs away. Always praise God. Always lift up the Lord. Always offer up the sacrifice of praise continually. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. God bless you, saints. You may be seated. Let's stretch our hands forth for the people in here who are either not well or relationships or financial needs or any other one of a thousand possibilities. We thank you, Lord. Let's believe right now. Father, you can do all things. Lord, we thank you for touching those who are sick and healing them, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for touching those who are in financial crises, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the way, the truth, and the life in every situation. We thank you, Lord. For those, Lord, who uh, perhaps have relational problems, Lord, in their marriage or with their children or wherever, my God, or or, or other, other kin, Lord, in Jesus' name, touch them, Lord. Bless them. Heal those situations, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And if you've got a need that I haven't mentioned in general there, just, just lift it up to the Lord right now and thank him for touching you and setting you free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't forget uh, giving. We, If you want to put cash in, the, uh, the wishing well up the, up the back there is a good place to put that. Or if you want to fill out a, uh, an envelope and put a credit card number on it, you can do that too and throw it in there. Or you can uh, use as we'll go through and we'll get to it when we go through our announcements today. So let's see what we've got for this week. Um, we're, still, uh, we're still observing the 2.5 metre distance. Obviously masks are, are not mandatory anymore. Okay, next one. Please silence your phones and turn off church Wi-Fi off during the service. Thank you. Next one. Please uh, fill and sign our media release form on the back of the table. If anyone hasn't done that yet, um, that's fine if you'd rather not do it, but we just can't have you coming up the front or partaking in any kind of video here. And our services are regularly videoed, so you need to tell us if you haven't haven't signed that form, okay? So um, also membership forms are available there. We'd love to um, have anyone who hasn't signed a membership form become a member of ours. You're not signing your life away. It's, we're not joining a cult. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a... a, a it's really just a physical thing that says, this is my home, at least at this point in time, this is my home. Okay? Doesn't mean you can't leave or anything like that. Okay, prayer and intercession group, Tuesday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. See Robin or Judy down here at the front, and uh, they would be more than happy to have you come along. And it's great to have them praying for the needs of our church. Just so appreciate that. Did you get your folder? Someone left a folder here the other day. Yep, okay, great. I left it where it was so you'd know where to get it. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, Graham's Bible study is still in recess, Graham, for another week? Yep, okay, not on this week, that's that's what I'm saying. Yep, okay. Next one, we're having a review of our podcast on our Facebook uh, page, which will be our podcast this week, and we'll be discussing it the following. So... 
If anyone didn't catch that Bible study, maybe you can catch up with this, but it won't be obviously as in-depth. It's only going to go for uh, probably about 40 minutes. So we're just going to brush over the top of what we've studied and give a bit of a timeline on that. Okay, next one. Holy Spirit night is tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Be a great time. Six o'clock tonight. Come along and be a part of that. And if you never have, make sure you make it here and you experience just the presence of the Spirit like never before. Praise God. Okay. Ladies Bible study. Nice new slide up there. That's pretty soon. How long did you work on that one? Wow. That's great. Notice she was drinking coffee when she did. So, you know. Okay. Next one. Ladies lunch and craft afternoon. So at 12 o'clock each Friday, if you haven't worked it out, the Bible study starts at 10 that we just saw. This one lunches at 12 after the Bible study. It doesn't mean if you don't come to the Bible study, you can't come to the craft afternoon, okay? And, and vice versa. If you come to the Bible study, it doesn't mean you have to stay for the craft afternoon. But I tell you what, I've seen some of the lunches you ladies eat. My goodness. Wow. Okay. Thanks for being faithful in your giving. And this is the other way you can give into our church. And that's by uh, offering envelopes and dropping cash or credit into the wishing well. Go to newhope.com.au. You can also uh, press on the giving button there when you get there. And that'll take you through it. Okay. Or you can see Graham or myself and get the church details and you can do direct deposits. Okay. All right. Thank you. So without further ado... Let's give a hand to Glenda, who's coming to share the word of the Lord with us today. Somebody whistle. It's been a long time, I tell you. Long time since I've been whistled at. <laughs> a little boy at school whistled at me once. I felt quite encouraged. Oh, I'm going to turn this on. Maybe I shouldn't have had that on there anyway. Right, I'm on now? Yeah, I'm on now. Okay. Oh, I, said, I said a little boy whistled at me once at school and I was so encouraged. <laughs> Friend for life. <laughs> okay. So... This morning, we're talking about resurrection. Now, I know we've already had Easter. And um, a couple of times during that Easter week, people said things like, um, he died, he's going to die for us on Friday. And then resurrection Sunday's coming, and that's when he's going to rise. Well, people, hello. It's already happened. He did die. And he's already risen. And the point of the whole thing is he is alive. So he's not going to go through the process. I really upset people when I confront it. But he's not going to go through the process every year just because we have Easter. Hey, who would? <laughs> so my first slide this morning says, before we start, do you like God's handiwork? Isn't that beautiful? That was one of my photos, and I'm ju I was just in awe that day because it kept changing. You'll see another one soon, but, yeah, it kept changing. It's just amazing what God can do, and that's just the beginning, our creator. So I'm kind of calling this, I was once dead in my sin. I needed to come out of the grave. I needed the resurrection and the life. That, the, that only the I am could give. Slide two. Thanks, Jude. I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live even if he dies. And whoever lives in, who lives and believes in me will never die. So today we're talking about that verse, but I'm going to hone in on the I am part of it, the I am. Thanks, Jude. Slide three. So God's name discloses who he is and what he's like. He is the I am, the eternal, unchanging, self-existent one. 
infinite and glorious in every way, and above and beyond all created things, is God. When Jesus applies the title, I am, to himself, he claims to be God. In John 8, 58, it says, I assure you, most solemnly tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And he's talking about the Old Testament Abraham. Before he was born, Jesus was the I am. You might remember if you've read Genesis, in the first part it says, let us, let us, meaning Father, Son and Holy Spirit as one. That's where I'm coming from. They are the I am. He's not a helper to God or a great teacher, but the divine, eternal, pre-existent, infinite, perfect being. He is Israel's God. He is greater than Moses because he is the God of Moses. He has life in himself and he can give life to us. Thanks, Jude. The next slide. So... There are seven I am statements in the book of John that actually stand out. It's written I am many, 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 many more times than that. But the statements are, first of all, I am the bread of life. So I've given the background verses there for people that like to save them and study them later. So he refers... More important, sorry, than solving the physical hunger for food through bread, Jesus offers himself as the bread of life to fulfil deeper longings and an eternal need. You see, in the Old Testament, you might remember the story they were going through, passing through the wilderness, and God fed them with manna. But there were conditions to the manna. They had to eat the manna and not save it for another day. So they had to eat it right there and then. They had to consume it so that it gave them life. But now we have Jesus. We are meant to do a similar thing. We need more than physical bread, and we need it from someone other than ourselves. So God will provide what we need most, and we should raise our eyes in faith. This bread of life is now before the Jews in the, in the manna story. The manna in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus who was sent from God and he comes down from heaven. He must be received by faith, like the manna was, and he must be eaten, who must be eaten, fully taken in, and who gives life. <clears throat> so the next one is, I am the light of the world. Now, light's one of the most prominent themes in John's Gospel. The world is lost and hopeless and in darkness. The darkness cannot change its condition. Light must enter in and invade. You know, it's like to be in a dark room. Lots of us get up in the middle of the night. It's very dark. You've got to know where the obstacles are. But if you're in a place where you have never been and it's dark, you can't see anything. You don't know any of the obstacles. No one can see or lead others in the darkness. So light is necessary to guide us and walk us forward. Jesus is the light. Number three is I am the door or the gate, and number four, I'm the good shepherd. They're both together, and there's a reason for that. In John 10, 1 to 18, Jesus makes two of the I am sayings together and he claims he's both the door through which the sheep enter as well as the shepherd who knows the sheep and lays down his life for them. In Old Testament times, shepherds used to pull the, bring all the sheep in together. They don't do it now. The sheep just sleep in the paddocks. You know. In Australia, we're just drovers. We're not shepherds of sheep. So they used to bring the sheep into the fold, which was like a, a stone wall built around with just one entrance. And he would, he would count them. The shepherd would count them because he knew his sheep. So he would know if one was missing. And if one was missing, he would go looking for them. But he would bring them in 
And then he would lie over the entrance. And the reason he would lay down over the entrance is in case something came to attack the sheep or to steal the sheep. If you put that into the analogy of the church, that, you know, we're always aware that there's someone wanting to attack. And Jesus is our protector. So the metaphor of the door does not have the rich Old Testament background as shepherding imagery does. But Jesus is both the only way, the door, a person enters into the kingdom of God and the one who gives his life for the life of the sheep, whom he knows and protects. He knows you today. He knows you and he knows every circumstance. There's nothing, absolutely nothing hidden from him. Sometimes we think because God's not moving, he doesn't know what's going on. But he knows everything. Everything. He's the one who gathers the sheep and cares for them. He's the shepherd. And he's also the means by which they enter and are kept safe. He's the door. He lays his life down so no harm comes to his sheep. Jesus comes not to pile on burdens, but to relieve them and carry them himself. Jesus comes not to scatter the sheep, but to gather them together. Jesus comes to seek out, to rescue, to heal and to feed his sheep. He'll do so because he loves the sheep, like Pastor Colin said. He loves us. That's who he is. It's all about love. They belong to him. We belong to him. This is proven and accomplished by giving up his life for the sheep. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Jude. The next one is, I am the resurrection and the life, which is our verse today, but I'm going to come back to that. Number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus contrasts himself to anything before him that they thought led to the Father. Now, in the Old Testament, they gave sacrifices so they could come near to the Father. You know, they had to go to the priest and and the priest was the representative to God, but we don't have that today. In contrast, he's the only one who provides the way to the Father. But he is also, at the same time, the full revelation of the Father, the truth. Jesus is telling them there's nowhere else to look. Nothing you can do, nothing you can read, nothing you can say will bring you to Jesus, bring you to the Father except Jesus. There is nowhere you need to look or can look to find the true path to God. Jesus is that one way, that one path. He offers what Israel looked for and needed, and he replaced all prior things set up as temporary means by which we relate to God. All of these Old Testament ways pointed to him and and accomplished those limited things. Such as only making people ceremonially clean but not truly clean. You know, they they would rent their clothes and they would not rent them, (laughs) not lease them, but (laughs) there's a word that says, makes me laugh, rent them. Like they would tear their clothes and they would... To be clean and and they would wash themselves. But that that doesn't make us clean. The only thing that makes us clean is like the song we sang, we're washed, washed in the blood, washed in the blood of Jesus. It's the only cleansing power is that blood of Jesus. But he's here and he's, he's now here and able to accomplish salvation and redemption fully. And number seven is I am the true vine. And here in the last I am statement, Jesus speaks of a vine, a common Old Testament symbol for Israel, God's people. And in Isaiah, in two places, the language of the unfruitful branches is tied to Israel as the desolate vineyard, a dead vineyard. But further on in in Isaiah 27, it talks about the fruitful vineyard. But Jesus says the people of God have life and fruit now by being in him. 
And we are, we are grafted in to the vine. We are part of his vine. We are part of his family. We belong to him. So slide six, yeah. So we come back to our verse for this month. I am, I am, says Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Similar to other I am statements, Jesus doesn't talk about what he can do or give, but who he is. He doesn't just give bread like Moses, but he is the bread. He doesn't merely reflect light, he is the light. He doesn't just open the door, he is the door that you need to enter in by. So also in John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. This particular statement is delivered by Jesus to Mary, not to Mary actually, it's to Martha, in the midst of a desperate situation. It's a family crisis. They have a sick brother and they need him to be healed. And we pick it up in John chapter 11. So it's the story of Lazarus. And it, it starts off with, There's a certain man and he was sick. Now he was a close friend of Jesus, as were his sisters, Martha and Mary. Now you'll remember those names if you've read the other stories about the family. Martha was the task-orientated person and Mary was the one who would sit at Jesus' feet. So she had come to know him personally. So both the sisters go to Jesus and they tell him, Lord, our brother is sick and he's dying. Can you come? Well, they send a message. One one of my versions says they went there, but then as you read on, it's a little different. So when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not be unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, when Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he didn't go straight away. He waited two more days, which had his disciples wondering why he wasn't going straight away. So he waited in the place he was for two more days and then he left, which would have been maybe another couple of days' journey or something like that to get to Bethany where they were. So why did he wait? Why did he wait? This is something I've been on my mind this week. Why did he wait? So it was about timing. You know how we always, we, we pray and we want an answer now, you know? We want God to do something now. But he already knew what was happening and timing is important to him he doesn't want to waste anything. So it was about timing. He knew the law of timing and waited until Lazarus died. Then he left for Bethany. And when he raised his friend back to life, it got the attention of everyone in Jerusalem. So we're moving ahead. We're in verse 17. I'm going to jump a couple of verses. So when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days already. And when Martha heard Jesus was coming, she ran out to meet him. And the first thing she says is, oh, Lord, if you'd been here, now, has anyone ever said this? If you'd been here when this happened, it wouldn't have happened. So she's gone out and she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. (laughs) And And even now she says, I know that you can ask God and he'll give you. See, she's task orientated. There was a problem, she wanted it fixed, and she wanted it fixed now. So, but really, what was she doing? She was asking him to pray to the Father, right? She was asking him to pray. So, was she seeing him as just a mediator of prayer? It's a good question, isn't it? I don't know if it's right, but it's a good question. Did she see him as just one of God's helpers? 
and so many do? Is that how we sometimes look at Jesus? Rather, we might go to the Father rather than actually ask Jesus. And Jesus answered her with just a simple answer, your brother will rise again, to which she enters into some religious dogma about the last day and I know he'll rise on the last day and it must have been a religious dogma because lots of religions believe different things about heaven and the resurrection. Slide seven, thanks, Stu. So Jesus answered her and said, I am the resurrection and the life and he who believes in me Though he dies, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you, Martha? He didn't say Martha, but he said to her. Do you believe this? Martha replies, yes, Lord. I believe you're, the, you're Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. She then rushes back into Bethany and whispers in her sister's ear, The master is here and is asking for you. Now, Mary's the one who anointed Jesus' feet a little bit further on in, in the Bible and wiped his feet with her hair. She truly loves the Lord. Not saying Martha didn't, but in a different way, a deeper way. Mary rises and she leaves immediately and goes to Jesus, who is still outside the town. However, she immediately falls at his feet and worships him. She's not task-oriented like Martha. She's a worshipper. And it doesn't matter what's going on, she'll leave that and worship. I need to be more like Mary. She's, she's not about getting things done. She's about being in his presence. But this one, Mary, is the one who always stayed at Jesus' feet and she does know him. They have a relationship. She just doesn't know about him. She just doesn't know of him. But she actually has a relationship with him. She, like Martha, says, Oh, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. There were some, some onlookers who'd followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb who said, oh, well, they were mockers, actually. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also kept this man from dying, full of knowledge? But Jesus wept. <laughs> and Jesus asked, where have you laid him, Mary? And she says, come with me, he's in the tomb. Then Jesus went to the tomb and found Martha waiting there. She's waiting for him to do something. <laughs> and he said, take away the stone. And Martha stopped him and said, oh, Lord, by this time there's a horrible stench because it's been four days that he's been in the tomb. He's been dead for four days. The body, yes, you don't want to know. You don't want to roll back the door. So what does she want him to do? She doesn't want him to go in. She doesn't want him to roll back the stone. But Jesus answers and said, Did I not say to you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And as they rolled away the storm, the stone, Jesus lifted his eyes and gave thanks to the Father for the benefit of the onlookers so that the onlookers would know and believe that the Father sent him. And then Jesus cried out loudly, Come out! Come out! And Lazarus walked out of the grave, still wearing his grave clothes. Even his head was bound. And Jesus said, Loose him and let him go. Now, when I started off with, I was dead in my sin. 
I literally was dead in my sin. And I'm going to share my testimony now. Never shared it before publicly, so bear with me. So it was 2nd of September 1991. It was actually Father's Day. And we were walking in a nearby park. We'd left the house so that we could talk without the children nearby. You see, we're in the midst of a crisis in our relationship and therefore our marriage. We'd been here twice before. and Both times I'd cried out to God for help. And twice he'd restored us and our marriage, but this time it appeared it was unredeemable. We're at the point of no return. And as we walked in the park that day, we were the only ones out and about. It was a huge park. It kind of went for a kilometre or so through the middle of our housing development. There wasn't another in sight. However, in the distance, there came the sound of a motorbike. It wasn't roaring, but sort of putt-putting along. I remember looking up to see where it was coming from, and it was a street right across from where we were walking. It came down a hill to a T-section. There were two people on board, and you could hear them laughing and chattering out loud as it headed toward the T-section of the street. It turned left, but at that very moment, I don't know if the, if the pedal hit the gutter, but the bike rounded the corner and then all of a sudden accelerated straight into a telegraph pole. The bike burst into flames and so did its occupants. Suddenly our problems were of very little significance. We ran to the couple who were teens, just young kids, went to school with ours. He was on fire and we tried to extinguish flames on his body. I I think somebody came out with a blanket and put it around him, but it was too late. He died on impact. There was absolutely no life in him. The young lady, Leah, I've since found out her name, was crying out for help in agony as we snuffed out her burning clothing and reassured her she'd be okay. We were waiting for help. Hold on. You've just got to hold on, we were saying. She asked about the young man and I lied and said, oh, he's fine. We just need to look after you now. The ambulance came and began to work on her and told me to leave. I went back and sat down near the body of the young man and I I didn't know how to pray anything but a religious prayer, so I prayed the Lord's Prayer. You see, I'd gone to church all of my life, but it was just religion. I didn't have any faith. I didn't have a relationship. Jesus was a Sunday school story and good people went to church. As I walked away, mourning the loss of that young man and wondering who he was, where his mother was, and thinking maybe I might know her, I remembered why we had been there at that time. I realised I hadn't experienced death so closely before, although it had brought to memory an event two years previously while I was driving along a road just out of Springwood in the Blue Mountains. I'd passed a car which appeared to be veering across the road and as I looked in the rear vision mirror, I saw that car hit a motorbike and I saw the helmet roll off across the street. There were cars pulling up. There was not a house inside. It was like a deserted area. There were no mobile phones in those days so I drove on to the next town, straight to the police station, reported the accident. They took my my name and address and said, be on your way. Didn't see any point going back, so I I just went on to the meeting I was to go to that day. But about, let's find my place again. So, some months later, I was summoned to attend the coroner's court to give evidence of what I saw that day. And there I met a pinion rider who was now quite disabled. The partner had died that day, and so had the driver of the car. 
So here I was again this day, 2nd of September, 1991, witnessing right in front of me the same situation and bewildered as to why. However, that night as I tried to sleep, I began to cry out to God, why did all this happen? Why did I have to see that accident two years ago? Why did I have to witness that today? It's all about me, of course. Why, why, why is my marriage falling apart yet again? Why don't you fix my marriage, as I screamed out in my head? (laughs) But in the still and the quiet, once I stopped shouting in my head, I heard the voice of God say, I have restored your marriage twice, in fact, but now it's your turn to do something. Okay, I'm saying, not saying like I don't hear voices, but saying, okay, but how? And ever so quietly he said to me, put me first. Before your husband, before your children, before your job, before your interests, and I will turn your life around. He didn't say he'd fix marriage, actually. He just said he'd turn my life around. My immediate thought was, oh, dear, what would Graham say when I tell him I'm going to put God first? (laughs) I made the decision that very night, Jesus would be the first in my life. I went back to church, even though Graham didn't like it at the time, and the kids, they didn't like it either. The next day I told Graham I'd made a promise at the altar and I wasn't going to be the one to break it. I began to seek Jesus from that moment on and he was faithful to his word. And from that night on, I received a resurrection and life experience. The I am came. I'd been dead in my sin, but that night selfishly crying out to God, Jesus gave me his resurrection life. Just like Lazarus had been dead in the grave for four days and the Bible says and throws off an offensive odour, our marriage had been throwing off an offensive odour. You see, if I'd put Jesus first in my life instead of my stench of a marriage, I would have had a sweet-smelling aroma in my life. But there was a stench and it was infecting everyone around us, our children and our neighbours. It was dead and it needed resurrection. I'd known about Jesus, as many people will testify. Have that conversation this morning before prayer. I'd known about him, but I didn't know that he is the resurrection and the life. Growing up, I'd had an experience with God, but not a relationship with the I am. And I realised that you can have an experience with one or either of the Godhead. So some people just know Jesus. Some people just know Father God. They don't call him Father God, but God. Some people don't know the Holy Spirit. Many people don't know the Holy Spirit. So you can have an encounter or an experience with one part of the Godhead, but you have to have an encounter with the whole Godhead because it's the I am, it's the Father, it's the Son, and it's the Holy Spirit. And when you have that encounter, you have met the I am. You can say, you know, and I hear this often, I believe in God or I believe in Jesus. But to truly experience the resurrection life, you need to not only believe, but have a relationship with the I Am. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They are one, as I said, and they are the I Am. And when you have that relationship with the one Godhead, that's when your life changes. That's when you know he is real. So our marriage had been sick twice before, but now it was dead. And we'd put, in, put it in the grave and we'd rolled the stone across and we were about to leave it and walk away. The stench was too much. It had been dead way too long. 
Jesus said, I am, I am, I am is here. I am myself the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trusts in and relies on me, although he may die, yet he shall live. Picture up there of the tomb, the empty tomb. And when Jesus left that tomb and rose again in life, he gave us that life. It was at that time that we received life. Thanks, Jude. Slide number eight. And whoever continues to live and believes in, has faith in, cleaves to and relies on me shall never actually die at all. Do you believe this? That's what he asked Martha. Do you believe this? When Jesus says he is, I am the re resurrection and the life, he is saying he is God, the creator, the life giver, granting life to creation and breathing life into Adam. However, the first Adam chose sin, which brought about death again for mankind and brokenness for creation, for the rest of us. That's how we had broken lives, because of Adam's sin. Jesus comes as the second Adam, righteous and blameless in all his ways, comes to undo what Adam did and reverse the curse. Where Adam brought about death and decay, Jesus gives life and restoration. He provides not only resurrection and life to individuals who believe in him, but for the entire world. While many of the Jews wanted things from Jesus without having to receive and believe in Jesus, the offer of Jesus is actually himself. We often want something with no, we don't think we have to give anything, but actually we have to receive him, not just what he does. He doesn't give bread and allow people to reject submission and belief to him, nor does he offer to give life apart from that life being found in him. These are free and gracious gifts and they come only in and through Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the second Adam, bringing resurrection and life where the first Adam offered us only death. Slide 10, thanks. He called my name and I ran out of the grave that day. I ran out, this is the words from that song, I ran out of the darkness into his glorious day. I've always thought that photo I took many years ago, I think it was about 10 or 11 years ago, and I always thought that's, what it looked like. It looked like a cave with an opening to the light of day. And that's what he did for me that day. I came out of that grave into newness of life. So why did Jesus wait so long to help our marriage? Well, as I said before, he waited till Lazarus was dead to go to him. He knew the law of timing and he waited until our marriage had died completely. When I was desperate enough, I guess, <laughs> desperate enough to, to listen to him. The thing was, the timing, the actual timing was right. I wasn't just wanting him to do me a favour, we needed a miracle. We needed life. We needed the resurrection life in our marriage that only the I am can give. Our marriage had been sick twice before, but it hadn't died. But when it had fully died, and to everyone around, it was clearly finished. Jesus came with his resurrection life. He raised that which was dead back to life, starting with me. He had to start with me. I could ask him to do things to change Graham, and he would have said, that's not your business. <laughs> but he started with me. I started to change the way I reacted and, and learned how to respond. I started to, um, well, because I got filled with the Holy Spirit, something I'd suffered from was anger and depression. And that started to go when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. That started to go. There was a new me. 
And um, it was even hard for me to recognise sometimes, especially my kids, my kids. My kids, I think, were the ones most affected. When Lazarus was in the grave, it rep represented his old life, the natural life, being buried. He knew about God, but he didn't know Jesus was God. When Jesus called him forth out of that tomb, he walked straight into his new life, life in the spirit. No stench. Gone. The stinking thinking goes. The thinking behaviour goes. It just changed. It's incredible. It's incredible. You have to put some work in, by the way. No stench. Completely alive in every respect. A new life. Next one. Thanks, Julie. When Jesus came, he didn't come to start a religion. I found this on Facebook the other day because I've, I've used it with a neighbour who's suffered in religion. He said he didn't come to start a religion, he came to have a relationship with you and I. He doesn't care about the names of churches. He doesn't care about the denomination that they're in, actually. <laughs> he doesn't care about any of that. He only cares about our relationship personally with him. He sees us personally. Next one, Jude, I think. 2 Corinthians 5.17 in the Amplified says, If anyone is in Christ, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as saviour, he's a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things... The previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new light. Just as I said, life changes, the old passes away. So what's your need of resurrection today? It may not be your marriage. What's in the grave that you need to call out? Could be finances. It could be a dream you've long buried and left in the tomb that continues to nag you. Is it a call of God you buried? Been there too. In 2008, the movement that we belong to, once again, religion, a movement, decided to close our church and wanted us to join with others because we didn't have enough people. And the other church that... They got us to join with, there were about five sets of pastors, three sets of pastors, four sets of pastors. All had small churches and we were asked to join together as one. But when we went there, it wasn't our home. It wasn't where we were called to. So it didn't work. So all of us ended up, except for one couple, going on a sabbatical for a few years. We went to a house church or two. Stayed at home and watched Sunday morning television. And one day I said, we both came together and said, we've got to go back to church. We've got to find a home. So we went to a church locally and uh, with no intentions, we didn't go there to use our gifts or anything else. We just went there to be there. And I think it was the second morning, the pastor looked at Graham, didn't know him from Barris Open, and said, you've got to get back on the horse. In that week, we got a phone call to come and join a church, which we eventually uh, took over. So maybe for you, it's time to get back on the horse. Maybe you've laid something down. Maybe you've got something buried that you've dreamed of for years and, and people, people will kill your dreams. We've had that happen too, where people come and speak and, and kill your dreams and tell you that, oh, you're not called to do that or you're not that person. Well, don't ask them. Ask God. <laughs> ask God who you are and he will tell you. Pick up that dream, but don't pick it up the same way you laid it down because it's probably got a stench. What you want to do is ask God to pick it up. Pick it up for you and take you on the journey. Because although it looks dead, he can bring it back to life. You need the I am to resurrect that thing which is dead and give it life. All he asks is that you believe in, trust in, rely on and cling to him 
who is the I am, and you will have life. Last slide, Jude. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. What generosity is that? It's incredible, isn't it? So this morning I would like to pray for people. I'd like to pray for people that feel that there's something buried in their life, something that they've buried, something that they thought had died, something that seems destroyed and dead. Could be their relationship with Jesus that needs a resurrection. Could be your purpose and your call. Could be a plan that you have. And remember in Jeremiah 29, 11, this is a verse God gave me in the process of all that. He said, see, I have a plan for you. It's a plan for good. It's a plan to prosper you and bring you hope. Oh, before that he says, and it's not a plan for evil. That's important to put that in. But a plan to prosper you and to bring you hope. And I've clung to that verse all the way through since that time in 1991. That's been my verse. So he has a plan for you. It's not just a word for me. It's for you too. And it's a good plan. So if you want prayer this morning, I'd I'd like to, to pray for you. And I don't want you to pick it up again where you left off, like I said. You have to take off those grave clothes. You have to loose it into the hands of the I am and trust him and lean on and rely on him to release his resurrection, life and power into that thing and see it live again. So I'm just going to pray to close, but if you want prayer after that, please come forward and we'll pray for you for that situation. So Jesus, we know you are the I am. You are the resurrection and the life. And if we trust in you, you will breathe life into every dead situation that's in our life today and raise it up, Lord, through your power and grace that we have life abundantly.